You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Shabas Prakash. Hey guys, I wanted to take this opportunity to remind you all to like and subscribe. It really helps me to keep getting the best guests onto the podcast. So I really appreciate it if you did. And now on to the video. Happy to. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today we've got Corey Hostein from Newfound Research. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Corey. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So first off, I wanted to start off with a bit about your background and how you got into finance and your journey uh, to becoming, I believe, the CIO of Newfound Research today. Yeah, you know, I like to say that I sort of tripped and stumbled into finance, to be quite honest. Uh, When I was younger, my father was an entrepreneur who worked in, in the field of computers. And so I was I was raised around computers and internet and technology. And I started actually, I taught myself to program when I was around 12 or 13. And maybe like a lot of young millennial men assumed like I would somehow get involved with video games, right? So I actually wanted to program video games for a living. And I actually continued to think I was going to do that until about my freshman year of college. I went to study computer science and said, you know, this idea of programming video games really isn't for me. So I started searching and um, through my father's financial advisor was able to sort of hook up a bunch of very short term one day shadow type events in in Boston of different parts of the finance industry and really fell in love with this idea of being able to marry computer science with finance. And so at that point, I was uh, in undergrad, just sort of working on models for myself, ended up working on a lot of um, tactical based signals got introduced to another asset manager who said, hey, these are pretty interesting. Can I license them from you? Uh, Again, as a sort of broke college student, I said, absolutely. So put a company together named Newfound Research. Without thinking much about it, the the name Newfound comes from a lake in New Hampshire that my family used to go visit and research because I was licensing research. Um, Put the company together, honestly expected to make 500 bucks out of it. That would have been great. Um, And sort of just ended up licensing uh, the tactical signals that were coming from my models. I ended up going to graduate school right after that um, to pursue my master's in computational finance from Carnegie Mellon, which was really just a financial engineering degree where most of the students who come out of that program would pursue, at least at that time, a sales and trading role at one of the Wall Street banks. But during that time, I saw, you know, there's a real appetite in the market post 2008 for tactically managed models. And so I said, you know, if there's ever a time for me to jump into this entrepreneurial thing, now is the time. And so that's exactly what I did. I got out of grad school in early 2011, started trying to grow the business. And then around 2013, really pivoted the business to be less about licensing research and actually take a lot of those models in-house and manage our own separately managed accounts and mutual funds. Right. So would you say sort of your programming background is what drove you to become a quant compared to say uh, being an equity investor or being someone who picks stocks or, you know, value from that kind of standpoint? Yeah. You know, I think I always sort of had that computer science part of me that really valued the automation that could be brought with computer science. So actually one of my first internships that I had was with a traditional fundamental manager who was doing bottom up equity allocation. And the problem that he faced as sort of a solo, semi-solo practitioner was he had an investment universe of about 400 stocks, which meant that even if he did a deep dive on every single company, he couldn't get through all those companies in a year. And so what I was really working with him was to take the core of his process and what he understood and backtest it and determine the statistical significance of what he sort of had learned in his gut over time and then make his process scalable so that I could cut away, say, 50 to 70% of the companies and let him then spend the qualitative time researching the rest. So I definitely always had that uh, sort of systematic bent towards my approach. But I think the reality is every investor reads early Graham and Buffett and thinks of themselves as the next great stock picker. I certainly had that period of, of time as well, but I've realized that that is just not who I am at the end of the day. I got it. And so sort of new fund research is kind of like a hedge fund, but it started off as a research house. 
Yeah, so Newfound really started as a research firm. We would either license tactical signals from our models to other asset managers or sort of um, towards the you know, 2012, 2013 period, we actually collaborated with other asset managers or large RIAs and helping create strategies together. So we sub-advised some mutual funds. Eventually we said, you know, we really think there's a right and wrong way to do this. And so we want to directly advise right. these funds. So we don't actually manage a hedge fund. We launched um, a suite of mutual funds. We have some ETFs that track indices that we run as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, we try to provide a lot of our core thesis is around trying to provide investors access to growth while trying to focus very heavily on proactively managing downside risk. And we do that, as I mentioned, tactically, but the core concept is a lot of investors have internalized that they want to diversify across asset class exposures and, and securities. I call that what-based diversification. I think there's also tremendous benefit to this idea of how and when-based diversification. Right. How are you making your investment decisions and when are you making them? And I think for us, we're really looking to help investors expand the breadth across which they diversify. Absolutely. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. So I wanted to sort of jump in to the more finance stuff. So I wanted to start off by asking you, you know, recently there's been a lot of talk by a lot of uh, some of the bigger names in finance that investors have to move up the risk curve because, um, you know, yields are so low and, you know, the Federal, uh, the Federal Reserve has set rates at zero. So, you know, why do people have to move up the risk curve? Why can't we just sort of accept uh, lesser returns? And, you know, what happens to a typical 60-40 portfolio with the yields where they are on the 10-year right now? Yeah, it would be wonderful, right? If we could just all sort of say, okay, uh, rates are lower, let's just live with that and maybe we'll just save more. Um, I think the unfortunate reality is there's a large number of investors out there who have what I'll call fixed dollar liabilities that are far dated in the future. So this is going to include institutions like pensions and endowments. A lot of endowments are set up in a way where they have to withdraw four or 5% of their capital every year. Uh, a lot of pensions have fixed liabilities in the future that they have to meet. And so even if they see interest rates go down, it doesn't mean that they can lower their future liabilities. They still have to meet those liabilities. They still have to hit those return targets. I would argue a lot of individual investors also think this way. Uh, it used to be you sort of had the million dollar retirement target in mind. And so you were trying to hit that dollar objective by a certain age, which if you sort of reverse that implies a return expectation. Yeah. And so the market sort of has constructed itself in such a way that there's enough parties that have to do this, that when we start to see interest rates decline, and I think the meaningful part here is that when your return on lower risk assets continues to go down, it means you have to start moving into higher risk assets. So just as an example, let's say you wanted to achieve a seven and a half percent return. And I think most people would be very happy with a 7.5% return if they could achieve that year in and year out. Back in 1995, you could have just bought a U.S. Treasury bond and had a 7.5% return. That could have been 100% of your portfolio. Right. Today, you probably need about 90% equity exposure. And it's not just going to be equities. It's going to be real estate. It's going to be private equity. So now not only is everyone crowding into equities and higher yielding assets, but a larger portion of their portfolio is now going towards illiquid assets. And I think a really important part of this um, equation that has to be considered is that it fundamentally means that individuals really can't achieve anything by saving anymore. That if you just put something in your bank account and try to save, you're ultimately going to lose that to inflation because there's no real savings rate on your, on your savings account anymore. Right. And so it turns the market into a savings vehicle, right? We've seen a huge adoption of here in the States 401k programs. Uh, target date funds have grown from an $8 billion to $2.5 trillion industry over the last 20 years. And so as more and more people start to use the market and a tighter link between the market and the economy, 
uh, and how they interact, that there's this very real wealth effect that when suddenly people suddenly see 30% of their wealth disappear, that consumer behaves very differently. You know, as you mentioned, um, now you need to sort of have 90% in equities and real estate and, you know, more, and, 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 you know, significantly more riskier assets. So, you know, my question is, what is, what are the implications for future returns you know, of this dynamic of moving up the risk curve? Is that sort of lower future returns? And I believe in a previous interview, I think you pointed out that the 10 year yields are usually a good indicator of returns over the next 10 years. So do you think we're going to see some extremely low returns on uh, risk your assets. You know, when you look at um, fixed income, right? So when we talk about sort of capital market assumptions, which are what do we think different assets are going to return uh, and, and how do we think they're going to behave over, say, the next 10 years? Fixed income is actually pretty trivial to guess, especially when you're talking about U.S. treasuries for U.S. investors where there's really no currency risk. At the end of the day, when you buy a bond, you know what your yield to worst is when you buy it. And if you just hold it to maturity, well, that's going to be the yield you get, barring a default of the U.S. government, right? Now, it gets a little bit more complicated when you're talking about a, say, 10-year U.S. Treasury index that buys a 10-year U.S. Treasury, and then as it becomes a 9-year U.S. Treasury, it sells it and buys a new 10-year. You get some roll-down effects, and you get all of a sudden uh, some changes in that value based on how yields move up and down. But at the end of the day, uh, that starting yield really is the primary driver of returns. There's actually a rule called the two times duration minus one rule, which says that for an exposure like treasuries, you can say the starting yield is going to be a very good predictor of returns over the next two times duration minus one years. So if duration is 10, then it would say, okay, over the next 19 years, the yield we have today is going to be the annualized return over those 19 years. So the reality is we know in fixed income, the returns are very low. Now, the question is what happens in equities? And I think there's sort of two competing thoughts here, right? One is about as demand for equities goes up, their prices go up. If the underlying fundamentals don't meet those prices, then the implicit return that you're getting for the price you're paying must be going down, right? Your sort of, sort of total shareholder yield is going down. Your dividend yield is going down. Your buyback yield is going down. Your earnings growth expectations for the amount you're paying has gone down. And so therefore, you wouldn't expect to earn as much in equities. And people sort of tie that to equity valuations. There is this sort of subtle other camp, though, that I think is an important thing to recognize, which is that um, demand flows can create a meaningful disconnect from fundamental pricing for far longer than I think people think it can. There was a paper that came out recently in the fall that talked about the inelasticity of aggregate market prices and estimated that every time someone tries to take a dollar and buy stocks with it, it drives up the aggregate value of the stock market by $5. Wow. <laughs> right? So think now you say, okay, well, the aggregate value of the stock market is trillions of dollars. So what's another $5? But what happens when a lot of people suddenly go, well, I can't save my money anymore. And I don't want to hold fixed income anymore. And I want to buy more stocks. Well, that increase in demand is going to continue to drive up stock prices. So you could continue conceivably to see so long as demand is sustained and that marginal demand doesn't decline, you could continue to right. see strong equity market returns, arguably totally disconnected from fundamentals. But there is, in theory, at least a point at which that sort of ends. Um, and you would expect it to end poorly, the more it sort of gets disconnected. So that's a long way of saying, you know, people have been forecasting low equity market returns since the mid uh, you know, 2010s. So probably about 2014, 2015, people said, hey, markets are expensive. The next five years were pretty good. Very volatile, but still very good if you just bought and hold. So there's nothing that says the next five or 10 years still can't be good for equity market returns with those supply and demand mechanics in place. So it's basically, you know, the main determinant of uh, returns in equities is going, is going to be flows. It's going to be passive flows. Uh, and, you know, as you pointed out, that study you know, exactly showed that. And you now one of the things that you mentioned at the end is 
uh, it's been a lot more volatile. And, you know, an important point to note is that higher returns come with a lot more volatility uh, over, say, you know, the last five years or the last 10 years when this dynamic has been playing out in, say, in the mid 2000s. So you know, what is the big change that has led to this? You know, you point out the volatility. And I think there's sort of two ways you can you can look at this. You can just look at a graph and say, wow, the last three or four years have been really volatile in an expanding way, both positive and negative we um, looked at sort of the weekly returns of the S&P 500 over the last 30 or 40 years and tried to measure um, what's called the kurtosis. So this is uh, the fourth distribution of, of fourth moment of the di return distribution, and it measures how fat the tails are, right? And so for right. people for whom that was just gobbledygook, you can basically think of it as when we're trying to measure those fat tails, we're trying to say, uh, the fatter the tail, the more likely it is we're going to see extreme events occur happen with greater frequency, right? Okay. So the higher the kurtosis, the more extreme things happen. Um, and so what you see is that if you sort of do what's called an expanding window process, that you constantly keep introducing the new data as it shows up, the measure of how fat-tailed markets ha are is consistently going up over the last 20 years. Um, you would think, obviously, a jump in 2008. Now, most people would think, well, post-2008, things were, really weren't crazy until 2020, but we continue to see an increase in how fat-tailed markets have become. So you are seeing it quantitatively, that market risk is seems to be becoming more extreme, right? Both to the right and the left. That doesn't mean, hey, everything's bad. We're seeing melt-ups just like we're seeing meltdowns. To your question is, why? What is the qualitative reason behind this? And here I can only sort of ascribe some theories. And I actually wrote a paper this year called Liquidity Cascades right. that, awesome. that talks to this. Thank you. Um, and and uh, I'll, I'll take that compliment. And I have to sort of say, uh, I think it was great because it relied on so much prior work that other people have really pioneered. So Mike Green at Logica and his work around passive investing, uh, Vanir Bansali, Christopher Cole, Ben Eifert, uh, Jem Carson. There were so many people that were influential and extremely helpful to providing direct feedback on the paper. But it really tried to say, what are these driving features in markets that are making them more fat-tailed? And as I did the research, there were really three narratives that came up. The role of central banks moving from sort of referee to to active participant in the markets, the growing role of passive investing. And here I don't just mean Vanguard, I mean indexed ETFs, as well as changes in market access, right? So going back to that idea of just adopting target date funds, just a very passive way for people to invest, something that didn't exist 40 years ago. And then finally, the role of what we'll call volatility contingent strategies. And these are things like explicit strategies where you might sell vol, so covered calls or something like that. Um, or these are going to be strategies that are very related to volatility, that their allocation is going to change as market out vol changes. And the ultimate thesis of the piece was that none of these ideas individually are enough to drive this market vol, but they're all linked together, right? So going back to the very sort of first question you asked about people being driven up the risk curve, well, as central get banks get more involved and try to create stability, we're seeing a suppression of interest rates. We're seeing a suppression of credit spreads. And investors keep having to move up the risk curve into more and more crowded positions. In doing so, they're adopting a lot of sort of strategic and tactical ways to try to manage risk that are heavily correlated to market volatility. So when market volatility goes down, they tend to lever up. When market volatility goes up, they all tend to sell at the same time. Right. And so when you get these sort of pro-cyclical events, you can see people end up in very crowded positions, a very crowded equity exposure. And then when there's an exogenous shock, like uh, a COVID-19 event, it causes a forced unwind that all of these parties start to sell at the same time. And as one sells, it forces another to sell. Banks start hitting risk limits. They have all sorts of structured products they have to hedge. Markets go absolutely haywire. And central banks are forced to step back in and calm everything down. And the whole cycle sort of starts anew. And so I would argue that it's no single thing that's driving this market today. 
I think it's just as much Wall Street bets and Robin Hood investors creating chaos to the upside as it is banks selling structured products in Asia on the downside. And I think all of these things are, it's a confluence of effects that's leading to greater and greater extremes, both to the positive and the negative. I wanted to take that, uh, take what you just said on central banks. And, you know, there was a book that came up last year. I don't know if you've read it. It's called The Rise of Carry. It's I have simple. read it. It's a great yeah. book. Definitely. You know, it's very simple. You know, it's simple for people like me to understand you know, who don't know too much. So I just wanted to ask you, you know, it talks of sort of a volatility suppression uh, regime where, you know, central banks are, you know, reducing rates and adding liquidity, which is also discussed in your white paper. And do you sort of agree with this view? And, you know, what is the role of central banks in affecting volatility and how dangerous is, the, is this? Uh, well, I think there's sort of two ways to think about central banks, right? Um, the first is what are their explicit policy actions? What are they doing explicitly that actually impacts market structure, right? So you can talk about the ways in which they may or may not manipulate the, the, the treasury yields. And what does that do for creating stability in markets? So if they can provide liquidity to treasury markets, for example, how does that flow through to create stability in other markets? Well, treasuries are a huge form of collateral. So if all of that, if there's more volatility in the collateral market, it means that a huge amount of margin has to be taken down, which means you get a ton of forced selling. So if, if all of a sudden central banks can create stability in markets that are being used as, as securities collateral, well, that can help create knock-on effects to reduce forced selling and happening in other markets, which calms everything down, right? I think chaos really occurs when people are forced to take action, right? When you hold futures and you say, well, I don't need to sell for any reason. I can be long these futures. And then all of a sudden futures margin goes up. Well, you are forced to sell, right? There are these sort of non-linear risk limits that can be hit. And when all of those are getting hit at once, it's, it's quite dangerous. So right there, the explicit actions, um, certainly central banks and lowering the discount rate are trying to get uh, banks to, to be able to lend more um, and facilitate more in the credit markets. But I think there's a second piece to the central bank puzzle. And by the way, I should have caveated all this with, I am by no means an expert on central banks. There are people far smarter than me on these topics. Um, and if, you, if anyone listening to the podcast does a quick search for liquidity cascades, one of the things I've tried to do on the webpage where I host the paper is create a whole compendium of additional links to folks that I, I think have written on these individual topics if you want to do a deeper dive. But back to my main point, I think the second piece of the puzzle that's really important with central banks is this idea of narrative policy, which is by saying certain things, banks can potentially get markets to behave better without actually taking any action. By saying we are going to keep rates lower for longer, central banks are effectively saying, take margin risk. We're not going to raise rates on you. Start to borrow. It's going to be fine, right? Um, that, sort, that, there, that shouldn't go overlooked, right? When central banks say we will do anything to keep markets stable, it is inviting risk-taking. And the more they can set that policy and, and forecast it in a way that, that market participants believe, it can invite certain participant behavior that inherently stabilizes markets. And could you talk about exactly how these flows go from passive, uh, go to passive from active? And you know, what causes capitulation? And you know, where does the capitulated money go? So this is, this is, I mean, I don't think it's any surprise to anyone that passive investing has grown dramatically over the last 20 years. If you, if you, if you're listening to this podcast, my guess is you have an interest in financial markets and you're well aware of the trend, right? The question of why has there been capitulation, I think is, um, I don't know if I've got a great answer to that, probably because people are more fee conscious nowadays and passive. The, the, I would sort of argue that the structure, the mutual structure that Vanguard adopted, that all sort of these benefits of scale have been passed back to the shareholders uh, has been a huge, huge 
sort of knife in the back of the asset management industry. It's not necessarily that passive is better than active. It's that when passive is so cheap, it makes it really hard for active to outperform. Right. You know, when you're an active manager and your 50% of your fund sort of mirrors the benchmark, well, it basically implies that your active fee is twice whatever the fee you charge is when passive is more or less free. So it, it just makes your, your hurdle that much higher. So you have this sort of not only is passive outperform, so people are going, why bother with active, but the fee is so much lower. I do think around 2015, there was a lot of discussion around um, the Department of Labor's sort of potential ruling around uh, what it meant to be a fiduciary. And the proposed new rule did make it seem like if you adopted a more expensive strategy as an advisor, you would have to defend that to regulators. And I will say in my personal experience, anecdotally, I did see a lot more advisors begin to adopt passive at that point out of fear of regulatory kickback. I think there's another important part of this, though, which is that we've also seen a huge adoption in ETFs over the last decade here in the U.S. and, and really around the globe. And in the U.S. in particular, there's a nice tax loophole that gets to be taken advantage of. So you've really seen a huge adoption and I would argue that most ETFs aren't really passive on their label, right? That they smart beta ETFs, for example, certainly take active bets that are off benchmark. But when you consider the fact that even if I sell a value mutual fund to buy a value index linked ETF, the primary difference is in how that flow is ultimately traded. When I allocate to a mutual fund, there's a manager who is, in theory, buying or selling stocks that they like. And so they're providing liquidity to individual securities based on their view of valuation. When I then go buy an ETF, assuming I'm not just someone else isn't selling me their shares, what's really happening is there's a market maker in the middle, someone called an authorized participant who's going out and buying up the basket of underlying stocks. And they don't care about the relative valuation. They're just trying to buy that basket as cheaply as possible so they can turn around and deliver me a share of the ETF. And I think what's really important to acknowledge there is that the process of how continuing flow gets allocated. If there's a dollar coming into the mutual fund every day, well, that manager hopefully is in theory constantly putting buying pressure in those securities they consider to be undervalued. With a lot of these indices, they rebalance once, twice, maybe four times a year. And in between rebalancing, they're completely drifting relative to market cap weighted performance. And so as a new dollar gets invested at the point of rebalance, they're certainly expressing these active bets. But every new dollar that comes in after that, well, that basket is being bought in, in proportion to how the weights have drifted, which is driven by the relative performance of the underlying stocks. And so there's a very different flow dynamic that occurs there um, that potentially has very profound impacts on market stability. In an interview with um, Resolve Asset Management, I, uh, I'm gonna quote from that interview. You said that, quote, the whole idea of markets being efficient on stock versus being efficient on flows is maybe one of the great misapprehensions in academic finance. If there is a mismatch between a stock's float adjusted market cap and the average dollar depth of the order book, this could cause a really large sustained and reflexive distortion in pricing. Could you explain this concept uh, and sort of simplify uh, you know, yeah. what exactly you're trying, what, what you're saying. Yeah. So I'm going to make up some numbers, right? But let's say Apple is 6.5% uh, of the market cap in, in the S&P 500. And let's say Under Armour is 10 basis points of the market cap, right? I think Under Armour is probably a bad choice because it's got two share classes, but let's assume one of the share classes are both together 10 basis points. So you're talking, if I'm doing my mental math correctly, 650 times larger. Now, the question is, if I buy a dollar of the S&P 500, it's going to get split across all those companies, right? So I'm going to take six and a half cents and try to buy Apple, and I'm going to buy 0.1 cent, I think, if I'm, again, doing my math correctly, of Under Armour. Now, the question is, does Apple 
have 650 times the liquidity that Under Armour has, right? So much more of my investment is going towards Apple. And if it doesn't have 650 times the liquidity, is it possible that as more and more people are buying a market cap weighted product, if there is a mismatch and it doesn't have sufficient liquidity to deal with the fact that it's 650 times larger and demanding 650 times more of the flow that it will actually drive the price up. And you'll get this wedge that the larger cap names, which may not have liquidity that's directly proportional to their market cap size, can actually be driven up on a on price and a pure demand basis. And the pro cyclicality of that is that as they are driven up, they then command a larger proportion of flows and it, and it gets worse and worse and worse. Thank you for explaining that. Um, I had a question, you know, on academic research. So there's a lot of research today that shows, you know, smart beta strategies are really good. So, but the last decade has been kind of bad, you know, is this sort of because, you know, there's too many funds doing the same thing. And, you know, of course, um, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, there's sort of a lot of diminishing returns, you know, there's too much money going at it. And, you know, the returns start to get smaller and smaller. You know, is it a change in say the microstructure of the market is just, you know, funds you know, not doing a good job actually trading the strategy, you know, what's, what exactly is going on? I'm going to answer this first by saying I have absolutely no idea. I think that's probably the safest answer I can give you. It's a very good question to be asking, right? What we do know is that there was a huge amount of smart beta products launched in the last decade that probably have not lived up to their promises. All of them would say they're based on academic research. I think what's really important to consider, though, is that even when you look at funds that are theoretically tapping into the same factor, there can be massive dispersion in their realized performance. So, for example, if you just pull up a handful of value funds, they all look very different in their actual returns. Now, they're all sort of tethered to what the value factor has done. But at the end of the day, implementation choices make a big difference, right? How are you measuring value? Um, how many securities are you buying? How are you weighting those securities? When are you rebalancing? A huge amount of my research that I published is on that choice of when. And as it turns out, it can lead to dispersion of hundreds to thousands of basis points every single year between strategies that are otherwise identical. So it's hard for me to disentangle whether it's been a bad decade because of bad luck or because there's been some sort of deterioration of alpha. Now, I think probably the, the poster child here is value, which a lot of people have said, well, this has really suffered since 2007. And here I can only stress further that it's been a big implementation um, differential, right? If you look at more of the sophisticated quants who are not just buying on price to book, but they're doing industry neutral valuations and making adjustments for quality and selecting a cross-section of metrics that make more sense for a given industry, what you find is most of them actually continue to generate alpha well into 2017, 2018. It's really been the last two or three years that have been tough. So it's really hard to talk about the, it as in, a, in general. Now, I'll put a big comma there or, or a semicolon and say, that all said, I think it would be naive to not acknowledge the reflexivity of access that occurs within markets. So if we take a lesson from say commodity markets in the 2000s, what we saw was there was a huge broad adoption of passive commodity exposure among institutions in the early 2000s, right? Goldman Sachs launched their commodities index in the 90s. And all of a sudden a huge number of commodity index linked products became available and institutions just started passively allocating to them. And they did it in such a way that they actually distorted commodity markets themselves. Some of the papers found that there was a dramatic increase in correlations between those commodities that were included and not included, a dramatic increase in correlations between those commodities um, that were included and oil, which was sort of the biggest commodity, and actually some spillover effects that as more of these institutions held commodities, as equity markets became volatile, 
it triggered rebalancing. And so they would suck their money in and out of the commodity market. And so you saw spillover effects into the commodity market. Um, I do know that there is a, a peer of mine, uh, Marat Mali Boga, who's doing a research paper right now talking about how those sort of massive passives, as they're called in the early 2000s in the commodity markets, literally adjusted the term structure of futures because they were all buying front month contracts and that had implications for how the futures behaved. I'm using that as an example to say, I don't want to look at the last decade and not acknowledge that if all of a sudden there is a huge adoption of smart beta products that should reflexive, reflexively impact the returns of smart beta. You would sort of expect that the more people who flood into it, you would expect it to decay and probably the alpha should decay to a lower point that the sharp ratio would go down um, out of sample. And it might even go negative. If you have enough people crowd into it, you might see it turn negative for some time until enough of that crowd is, is sort of shaken out of the position and it renormalizes. So I think, um, again, I, I think there's strong evidence for a lot of this stuff. Historically, it's hard for me to disentangle the realized returns versus what could just be statistical noise, but I also don't wanna walk away without uh, acknowledging that the huge adoption could be reflexively impacting the returns themselves. Sort of, you know, when you talk about the returns, could you explain where, uh, you know, the smart beta risk premium comes from? You know, well, you know, why do these strategies, at least historically, you know, produce greater returns than the market? So it really varies per factor. Right. So, and it's going to change what the factors are depending who you talk to. Right. So, there's a factor zoo out there that is 500 different characteristics. I tend to think of sort of there's a couple big factors value, which is going to include all your things like price to book and price to earnings and price to free cash flow. You're going to have um, size, which it's questionable whether it's a factor, um, momentum low volatility and quality. Those are probably the big five. And depending who you talk to, some people say, well, quality and low vol aren't really factors. Whatever for this discussion, I'm going to assume those are the big five. And why they exist uh, is up for huge debate, right? I would sort of argue if we knew precisely why they existed, they would probably stop existing. They'd, they'd be easily arbitraged out. But I think there's sort of two camps, right? There's the risk premium camp, and then there's the behavioral camp. Now, the risk premium camp says it's not an anomaly that this sort of cross-section of stocks earns an excess return. They're doing it because they're riskier, right? So value stocks, for example, maybe outperform the market over the long run because they're actually just riskier stocks. I, I read a JP Morgan note once that called value stocks uh, sort of the basket of all the world's problems, right? It's all the companies that no one wants to own. So you should be paid to own them, right? Yeah. Um, on the other hand, the other side might be, well, maybe it's not actually uh, risk-based. Maybe it's behavioral. Maybe people start to see stocks go down and they panic or there's just certain industries they don't want to own or whatever it is, they sell them at a discount, Maybe there's actually forced liquidations. When those companies go down, uh, certain risk management triggers get hit and, and people are forced to sell them at fire sale prices that, you know, these are massively discounted companies that are out of favor and value investors come in and, and take advantage of that. So it's hard to say whether it's, it's risk or behavior. Certain factors like momentum, no one's really come up with a good risk-based answer to that. It really does seem to be mostly the misbehavior of investors that you're trying to exploit. Um, but someone might come up with a good risk-based answer. I don't, again, I don't think any of them Got it. are, are fixed. There's, right. there's arguments for every sort of factor out there. Got it. So I want to sort of jump back to the topic of liquidity once again. And so in one of your prior interviews, you, uh, you gave an example in March, 2020, there's a, there's an HFT firm, a high frequency trading firm, uh, called Virtual Financial, which needed $400 million sort of to just, you know, start providing liquidity again to the market. And, you know, when HFT traders stop using leverage in bad times, liquidity goes down. So how does this liquidity come back? You know, is it the central bank pumping, pumping it in? Uh, you know, what exactly, you know, what is that dynamic uh, there? 
Yeah. Well, what's interesting is it, it actually doesn't seem like liquidity has come back in the market. If you look at sort of estimates of market impact, right? So the question is, how do you measure liquidity? Right. Um, sort of the, one of the very most common ways of measuring liquidity is, well, if I had to trade, you know, if I had to buy 100 lots of, of S&P futures and then sell them, how much would I expect to actually impact the market? If I'm not going to impact the market at all, great, there's a lot of liquidity. If I'm going to move the market, well, then there's not a lot of liquidity. And you know, well, I've uh, read probably a very good definition, sort of like the disagreement between traders in a market. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with that, right? I think there's there's the disagreement aspect, perhaps. Um, I'd almost say like disagreement might lead you more to volatility. But when there's, you know, right, you have an order book, you have a bunch of people yeah. who want to buy and a bunch of people who want to sell. And there's, there's both sort of the willingness to hold, right? And, and how tightly I'm going to quote things. And then the depth of that order book, how many people are there willing to trade? And as that depth deteriorates, you know, and or it becomes one sided, everyone wants to sell and no one's willing to step in and buy, you get these rapid moves in price. So you know, the question is, how, how does this come back? Well, again, high frequency firms, as, as you mentioned, are highly levered. Right, they're they're operating with a huge amount of leverage, and a lot of that leverage is being achieved because they're posting collateral in the form of securities. Yeah. The more volatile those securities are, the less sort of valuable they are as collateral, and the less margin, um, the less leverage they can get. And so, as that leverage gets reined in, that causes liquidity to dry up, which causes markets to get more volatile and it becomes a very pro-cyclical spiral. So again, central banks can step in and provide some stability say to the treasury market, which then allows uh, more liquidity to be used because now that collateral, the, the volatility has gone down and now that collateral uh, is able to achieve more leverage. And so it sort of has a knock on effect that, that, that liquidity gets injected into the system. I mean, you may see in some cases, like as we saw in March, uh, central banks can step in and just outright buy assets. Now, the Fed didn't technically go out and buy um, uh, corporate bonds, but in effect, they set up the mandate to buy corporate bonds. And that had a huge impact on reducing, or it seems to have had a huge impact on reducing credit spreads and bringing liquidity back to the corporate bond market. I mean, we saw that high yield issuance and investment grade issuance was some of the highest it's ever been in June and July in the middle of a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. But it just got gobbled up by the market. So there's all sorts of ways that liquidity can come back. Certainly, you just almost, again, need that confidence. You need the willingness of players to participate within the markets. Um, but there are certainly risk constraints that do get hit in crisis periods that unless uh, we're, someone steps in to stabilize markets, they can just sort of never get unwound. So, you know, one of the concepts, um, you know, uh, that's been thrown around a lot is this concept of dealer gamma hedging pressure and, you know, that being the dynamic that's driving markets today. So could you explain what that is and, you know, why listeners of our show should be worried about it? So when you buy a share of Coca-Cola, stock, the equity, for example, there's probably someone on the other side selling you Coca-Cola, right? When you go to buy an option on Coca-Cola, on the other hand, the person on the other side is probably going to be an option dealer. And an option dealer is really taking the other side of that bet, right? So you're buying that Coca-Cola, say, call option, because you think Coca-Cola is going to go up. If Coca-Cola goes up, that dealer is going to owe you money. They don't want to owe you money, right? They're just trying to make money on the bid ask spread. So what they're going to do and in, in, is hedge that exposure, right? So what that means is if they have to make if if they're going to owe you money as the market goes up, they're going to buy some Coca Cola so that if Coca Cola stock goes up, well, good, they made money. Now, what's imp really important here to acknowledge is that the amount that they have to hedge with is not static, right? So when you put that trade on and you buy the options, the dealer is going to hedge a certain amount of uh, known as the delta. That's what they're going to use. That's sort of the options Greek. And they're going to buy that many shares of underlying stock. As the price of Coca-Cola goes up, they're going to have to buy more shares 
of Coca-Cola. The amount more that they have to buy is called the gamma, right? So that's where De La Gamma hedging right. comes in. It sort of references how much more they have to buy or sell. Now, if Coca-Cola stock goes down, great, they can actually sell some shares. Yeah. So there's sort of two really important things going on here that people talk about. One is what's happening at the index level. And what we've seen over the last decade is that there's been a large adoption of covered call selling at the index level or just call selling to try to generate yield, right? One of these strategies people have used going up the risk curve is selling volatility. Now, if I am selling a call option, I'm earning the premium, right? But I'm giving up my upside. Yeah. Now, again, the dealer on the other side of that doesn't actually want to take this bet, right? They're going to make money as the market goes up and lose money as the market goes down. So they're going to hedge that out. They're going to sell every time the market goes up and buy every time the market goes down. And you effectively have created someone who is sort of like a counterweight in the market. And as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, every time the market goes up, you have all these option dealers selling billions of dollars of S&P 500 exposure. Yeah. And every time the market goes down, you have them buying a ton. Right. And so yeah. that can actually act as suppress volatility, right? And so you arguably get abnormally low vol years like 2017. Now, another really important part here is people are selling call options at the index level, but they're also buying puts, right? They're buying that protection. And as the market moves from the call zone down into the put zone in a crisis, the exact opposite thing is happening. Now dealers owe money when, when the price goes down. And so they're going to short sell. And as the market goes down more, they're going to short sell more. So they're piling into the direction of the market, creating more chaos. So what do you see? Well, markets have very low vol. And then all of a sudden the market sells off and dealers massively start chasing moves to try to hedge, increasing volatility in the markets. So that's what's going on at the index level. The stock level, what's really interesting, and this is like a real huge emergent phenomenon in 2020, is the growth of individual individual speculating on on stocks with call options, particularly shorter dated call options, and a huge number of small speculators buying call options can actually bully these dealers into having to buy the underlying stock. And if the stock, if there's not enough float out there, and all these dealers buying stock actually drives the stock price up. Well, guess what? They now have to buy more because of that gamma effect. And so you, I think um, GameStop is an interesting example that happened recently, not to date this podcast too much, but it really looked like Wall Street bets saw a stock that had massive outstanding short volume, worked together to buy short dated call options in a way that forced dealers to buy the underlying shares of the company and force the short squeeze and saw the stock rocket ship up. And this is just an absolutely wild new phenomenon in the market. Um, as people are realizing, I think, I think Wall Street Bets calls it weaponized gamma. <laughs> yeah. So I want to move to sort of the real uh, world applications of you know, these models that we were talking about. So you know, since March, have you seen liquidity increase or decline? And you know, you know, as we speak, um, no. Do you have an opinion on uh, the direction of liquidity? Because that seems to be the key factor that's driving the market. I think you've seen liquidity dramatically improve in certain markets. So again, I think like it seems to me, and I'm not an expert in the corporate bond market, but it seems to me like credit markets, you've seen dramatic increase in liquidity. The sort of traditional measures of liquidity in equity markets, though, I don't think you've seen that. Um, you've seen a huge ingestion of liquidity in the derivatives market, right? The options market, the vol market. I, I don't know how efficient it's really been. Um, but again, so I, liquidity seems fragile still, at least in the equity market. And, you know, it might just be the measures are broken. It might be more happening in dark pools that's not getting measured. I don't have a great answer for that. Uh, but it certainly seems, and this is like a post-2017 phenomenon, honestly, that uh, a lot of the traditional measures of liquidity are still screaming that liquidity depth uh, is quite poor, market impact is quite high, uh, and that overall health of market liquidity remains fragile. 
In many languages, like Chinese and Japanese, um, disaster and opportunity are the same word. What strategies do you have to turn that to your advantage? So I think this is, a, this is an interesting question that I get a lot around. Okay, what are the implications of all this research? And I think, honestly, it largely depends on the investor. I think there's plenty of people for whom if they've got a 40 or 50 year investment horizon, keep saving, stay the course, buy your portfolio, rebalance, right? Dollar cost average, you're probably going to be fine. Uh, for those who really want to exploit it and think, well, I think this is a Fed fueled bubble and it's forcing people up the risk curve and I don't know how long it's going to last. Great. You can probably just pile on some leverage and ride it and make sure you got your tail hedges on. That might be one way to trade this. I mean, if you really believe the Fed and even now fiscal policy will never let the market drop, that would suggest you should probably lever up, right? Now, if you think there's maybe a big tail risk out there that they're going to destroy the dollar, maybe you buy some currency vol. Our sort of interim view is it, it's making it harder for investors who are near retirement, yeah. who need to make withdrawals and volatility and withdrawals do not meet well hand in hand, right? That if I want to take 4% of my money out every year, typically the way that works is I get to retirement, I have a million dollars and now I'm going to withdraw 40 grand a year. Well, if the market drops 50% and I'm 100% in equities, which no one at retirement is, but just for easy math, now all of a sudden that 40 grand is 8%. And there's no way 8% is a sustainable withdrawal rate. I'll be out of money in 12 years, right? So I think, I think what happens is we need to say, well, if markets are becoming more volatile, we're seeing more extremes to the upside and downside, we need ways of managing that risk. And I think there's sort of two ways of managing it. One is you either just take way more equity risk off the table, and now you're probably sensitive to inflation risk. So maybe there's three ways here. Now you're right, you just de-risk your portfolio and now you don't maybe grow as fast as you need to. Uh, the second is you just move faster, right? If the extremes are happening with greater frequency and they're more extreme, you need to be tactical at an increasing pace. I think that's sort of dangerous. I think the other sort of third play is you introduce some structural forms of convexity into your portfolio, right? And so that's one of the things that we did in our own portfolios. Uh, it's something we worked towards over the last six months after publishing our research was saying, we historically have managed a lot of risk via tactical signals. We think the market's now moving so fast that we still want to use some of these tactical signals, but we need to complement them with structural hedges both to the downside and the upside. So this might be out of the money call options, a ladder of out of the money call options on equities on the upside and a ladder of put options on the downside. And so really trying to say for those, you know, three plus Sigma events that are occurring with greater frequency, we need this convexity in place that we can harvest so that when sort of March, 2020 comes around, we can actually provide liquidity wow, we have these options that have popped, we can sell them and now become a, a, a work in a sort of position of strength to buy those securities we want to buy. Right. Makes a lot of sense. To wrap up the podcast, now I want to mention the fact that, you know, you run an incredible podcast called Flirting with Models. So thank you. I want to ask you, how do you interview people so well? How do I interview people so well? Well, that's, that's a great compliment. Thank you. And, and I will say you've done a tremendous job here. Um, I cheat. I cheat when I interview. Mm -hmm. So the wonderful thing about podcasts is people don't know when you recorded it, how much you edited it. Um, I am very particular about ensuring quality because I try to make the podcast be the podcast I would want to listen to. Um, so I spend a lot of time in preparation for every guest I have on. I tend to do at least a one hour pre-call. I then use that pre-call to map out a list of questions, 12 to 14 questions that I'll send to the guest to get their feedback on. If they don't like some of the questions, we rework them. And then they go into the podcast knowing the questions I'm going to ask so they can be fully prepared. Uh, what I tend to find is I do go off the questions, but most of the time that's, that's not a problem for the guests. They sort of know, but in many ways, like I don't want to say it's we have our rehearsal and then there's the performance. 
but in many ways, the podcast is a conversation I've probably already had with the person in, in discussed at length on these topics. And so there's no surprises. Uh, they're very well prepared to answer all the questions. And it's sort of just recording something they've already said. So it, it comes out, I think, very well, but it requires a lot more upfront work from me to do it, which is why I do a seasonal podcast and don't record them continuously all the time. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Corey. It was awesome to have you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you again for having me. And uh, congrats on getting this podcast off the ground. It's no small accomplishment. Thank you.